Man, I love seeing you guys come up. Wow. Come on up closer. Let everybody get on in closer. You're such a blessing. We love, you know what? We love having you guys come on up here. Come on up, sit down right here. That's good. That's a good spot. Hey, I want to talk about a word this morning, and you might not hear this word many times, but this word is called must. Like, you must do something. You must do. Has anybody ever heard that word, you must? Right. What does it mean? Somebody tell me what. You must. Because you have to do it. According to who? Your parents. So you're saying your parents are usually the person that says you must do this. Well, how many times have you, have you heard you must do this, but then you still don't do it, and it sort of goes away. They don't say anything else about it. That happens sometimes, right? But if, you, if you're told you must do something, how many of you are in school, and the teacher says you must do your homework? If you don't do your homework, what happens? You get a bad grade, you might not pass, right? A must is something that you have to do. So I want you to understand that word because you guys don't hear it as much as we used to hear it when I was your age. Like we were told that you must do something and it meant you must or you were going to get punished. And that's how they taught you how to do something that you were supposed to. It wasn't up to what you wanted to do. It was up to what the person that told you uh, what you needed to do. And of course, Today I'm going to talk about what God tells us to do. Do you know that God tells us there's things that we must do? That doesn't mean that we have a choice to do them. He tells us that we must do certain things. How many people, or, or tell me what God says we must do. Does anybody know what we must do? What? Lily? We, uh, we must tell other people about Jesus. What else? Yeah, well, God doesn't tell you you need to clean your room, but he tells you that you need to listen to your parents if they tell you must. What does the Bible tell us we must do? Does anybody know? What else, Michaela? We must learn about him. That's right. We must grow closer. Yes, sir. We must not lie. Those are good. What else? What do we must not do? Yeah, who did? Who did? Okay, all right. Well, okay, we'll talk about that a little bit. We'll talk about that a little bit later. All right, anybody else know things you must do, Mackenzie? You must not worship any other God. So we've got on the commandments here, right? He's telling you, even in the Old Testament commandments, things you must not do. And so you're even going to learn, some of you in children's church, God says you must do this, you must not do this. But the biggest thing that he tells us is that we must be born again. Do you know that Jesus said there has to be some time in your life, this has to happen to you as you get older, you must Ask Jesus to be your Savior. You see, you can't tell anybody else about him if you haven't done what you must do. So God doesn't say, hey, maybe you can do it, might. He says you must. And then after you do that, he tells you, you must do what I tell you to do. If not, I can't reward you. I can't bless you. And so our word we learned today was what? Somebody tell me. Tell me louder. Again. Does that mean maybe you have a chance to, might, no. What does it mean? You have to do it. Because who said so? Because who said so? Because God said so. Right, let's pray. Father, I love you, I praise you, and I thank you for these children. Thank you, Lord, for their hearts, their minds. I pray that you would continually use this church body to speak on behalf of you, to pour into them as they grow in knowledge of you. And I pray, God, as they reach this age to realize that they must do something to come into relationship with you. You let them see that so clearly. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I've got gummies for you. Now, I've got two different kinds up here. But remember, we've got to get these used up. I know you don't like them, but we only have one box left. So, okay. Are we going to, should I tell them, we probably do need to get some more gummies coming in our way. Right? All right, you need, do I need to say something to them about that? Yeah. All right, do you want me to tell them what kind not to buy? Yes. Okay. No. Right? Because why? Because they stick in your teeth and you can't get them out and because none of you get excited about them. That's why you have to use a toothpick. Yes, right. You got to use a toothpick sometime to get them out of there. Right. But, but at one point in time, at one point in time, you got to be thankful because these people went out and they bought all these things for you. So much so that we had 13 boxes of this particular kind. That, right? So this is the kind. And if somebody works for this company, it's no slight on you. But the kids would prefer if you would not buy 
these kind that get stuck in their teeth called mots. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the children this morning. Uh, not that I eat any besides just sampling to make sure they're good for them. But, but, uh, but if you get them, God bless you, we'll eat them too. But any other kind will be, what? Now you're creating confusion. That's not of God. <laughs> confusion is not of God. Confusion is not of God. So, and that's the pastor's wife. Okay. No, there's lots of good ones that are healthy. Okay. So listen, listen. All right. Now, who wants what? Take what you want. All right. Okay. Then you took you took that kind. I'm going to give you two packs of that kind. All right. There you go. All right. Anybody that wants two packs of these or one pack of these? Two packs of these or one pack of these? Two packs, okay. All right. You can get two packs of those. I want two packs of those. Okay. Doesn't really matter, does it? Just as long as you, you're out for volume, right? Two packs of those. Okay, there you go. Best, it's what we call negotiation. Okay. Could I have two packs of them? Sure, absolutely. Here you go. Now you can only get two packs of this kind here, or you can get one pack of this kind. All right, here you go. All right, two packs, are we on? Yeah, here you go, here's two packs. Oh, you want one pack of that? All right, okay. So any takers on the two packs instead of one? You want two packs? Okay. There you go. You want two packs or one? Now you can't have but, but just two, okay? Here you go, you want two? Okay. Two packs or one? Two packs, two? All right. You're welcome. So what's our word we learned today? Must. Tell me again. Must. Is must negotiable? Well, that's not what I see with a lot of parent-child relationships going on these days, right? Must just never was negotiable with us, but it seems like it's got a little bit more negotiable. Um, must, it means we have to do something. How many people have your Bible today? If you have your Bible, please stand and raise it above your head. Bear witness of God's word. Isn't that beautiful? You may be seated, please. If you would, turn to Hebrews chapter 11, along with John chapter 3. Hebrews 11, John chapter 3. You know, we really have reached the an age in our society today that if you're of a certain generation, you're being taught that you really don't have any must in your life. It is up to you to decide whatever it is suits the way that you feel or believe. Is anybody witnessing the same thing? There's no imperatives that are there. It's you have a right to think in this way, you have a right to think in this way, and somebody has violated my right to think this, and, and listen, I don't have to do this law because of this or that, or I don't need to go by these same kind of rules. It's like, it's, it's like they want no must, but there are must in this word, aren't there? There's must. And today, I want you to understand that with God, there's a must. And in his word, throughout his word, there is an imperative statements that say, you must do something. Now, is that according to me? No, but it's according to God. And I want us to be able to see today that whenever we accept that there's something that we have to do, that we don't have an option to get around it, when we either have to accept it and go by it and, and, and fall into that, that must, then understand you're really submitting to something that comes from somebody else. That's, I think, the biggest hurdle that people have today, submitting to something that comes from somebody else. In these two places of Scripture that I want to start today, I want to look at Hebrews chapter 11 first. 
in Hebrews chapter 11. For some of you that are versed in the scripture, you know that this would be the Hall of Fame faith chapter. It begins to talk about faith and it talks about those who exemplified great faith and it begins by saying, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, meaning that it's an invisible thing. Faith is something that you have to, to have. You can't see it, but it's something that you have to feel. You believe in something that you can't see. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So the writer of Hebrews begins by saying this, but understand, even we get that definition wrong. Sometimes we look at faith and we say, oh yes, how's that person's faith? Or I'm a man of strong faith, or I'm a woman of strong faith, or yes, how is your faith? Or faith is a big part of us. And we just stop at the believing. Do you believe in God? Yes, my faith is strong. I believe in God. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes, my faith in Jesus. I believe in Jesus. But we forget about that second part of faith that we learned about last week. Faith is not just believing. Real faith is trusting in that belief. You have to do more than just believe something. The writer of Hebrews goes on to say, by faith. And he starts with Abel, Adam and Eve's son Abel who offered a sacrifice to God which we know the story it was better than Cain's because it was a blood sacrifice and if we read down through here it says through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by God so that things which are seen were not made all things which do appear by faith all Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice if you're going to read this 11th chapter you're going to see the first thing he wanted you to understand is that by faith, all things were made by God. So first of all, by faith, God is, right? By faith, he is the cre creator, the sustainer. That's the first thing you have to believe. But in it, did anybody here see God create the world? Did anybody here see God this morning raise the sun? Did anybody see God order the clouds or the rain? No, by faith we have to understand that. So we have to believe that God is who he says he is, that Jesus is who he says he is. But he goes on and he says throughout this, the rest of this passage, by faith Abel did this. By faith Enoch did this. By faith, if you keep reading, by faith Noah did this. By faith Abraham did this. By faith Sarah did this by faith, uh, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses. He keeps on saying, so that faith wasn't just that they believed. All of those people had action in their belief. So part of our faith is not just believing in something, it's acting upon that belief. If we're clear, say we're clear. Are we clear? That's what he's saying. But there's a, there's a passage of scripture in this, this chapter that's huge. One verse, verse 6. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. Speaking of God. Now, hold on. Listen to the next statement. For he that cometh to God. That's in order for somebody to come to God, to be in fellowship with God. He that cometh to God. What's that next word? Tell me again. Tell me one more time. He that cometh to God must believe, now hold on, that he is. Now, how many people have heard this verse before? Now here's what I want you to see. Most Christians will sit and tell you. And these are people that, that believe completely they've accepted the Lord as their Savior. Most of them will sit and tell you, hey, listen, what do you need to believe? We need to believe that God is who he says he is. Exactly, we do. But do you realize it says they must believe that he is? And then what's that next conjunction word that right there? Tell me again. Do you know that that means the thought isn't finished? Must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now hold on, Christian. I have witnessed, and, and I would say thousands of different times to thousands of different people, and do you know what my common response that comes back to me is? I believe in God. I believe in Jesus. 
Or I go to the church down here and I've always believed and my grandmom and my granddad believed. Or maybe I've went through this certain thing to where I believe that Jesus and we celebrate Christmas and we celebrate Easter. We believe in our house. Yes, you believe that he is. But listen, there's an and in there. In order to please God, you must believe that he is and he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Now, let me explain diligently seek him. Diligently seek him means that there is an effort put forth in growing closer to God, an effort put forth in learning about God, an effort put forth in serving God, an effort put forth in keeping coming to God, an effort put forth in faithfulness to God, an effort put forth in representing God, an effort put forth in, in witnessing to other people must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. Must believe. Not an option here. I want to start by saying the church that we're in today, I wasn't raised in a church like this. And a lot of you weren't raised in a church like this. And the must that I grew up with was a little bit different. Basically, I must be able to attend once a week. And after that, when I get to a certain age, I must attend this class, and I must learn what they tell me, and I must pass this class so that they can give me a certificate to tell me that I officially know enough now to be able to go to heaven. That was my must, but that is not the must that the Bible gives us. And what we need to be able to see today is that God's must is what matters. And when you hear this phrase, it's a must. That means it has to happen. I want you to understand throughout God's word, he said it's a must. Turn to John chapter 3, if you will. This most common story, not a fairy tale, but a biblical story. It's an account of a day in the life of Jesus. Written by John the disciple that claimed he was close to God, the closest to God. Listen to this. Jesus had an encounter with a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus will learn his role in this, but in this encounter, Jesus was able to give Nicodemus a couple of musts. This must happen. Now, before you begin to judge Nicodemus, you need to realize something. Nicodemus was a very, very religious person. Nicodemus was smarter probably than most of us are. Nicodemus was part of the, what they call the Sanhedrin. Now let me explain to you the Sanhedrin. Back in that day, the Sanhedrin was made up of just certain people, 71 people. It was made up of the chief priests, the high priests, the scribes, the Pharisees. Listen, it was made up of these people, 71 of them, and they were the ruling body. They were the supreme court, if you would, for Jewish law. All those that upheld the law and all those that broke the law. It came before them. So they had to be up on, on what the Old Testament said and the Old Testament law. And listen, you have somebody come along like Jesus that's saying, hey, listen, I came to fulfill the law. I am the sacrifice. I am the sacrifice where there'll be no more sacrifices made. I'm coming to do this. I am the son of God. They're looking at him and they're saying, blasphemer. They didn't like Jesus. So listen as this man, Nicodemus, in John chapter 3, and you're familiar with one verse in John chapter 3. Let's say it together. It's verse 16. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son. Beautiful. We know that, right? It would be so much wonderful if we see the context that this is set in. So the something that seems so simple is right in front of our eyes. We know a, a verse, but I was led in a completely different way. There's a must in here. We offer John 3.16 today as if, hey, let's put it somewhere and hold it up. And hey, if you, if you want to do it this way, you can do it this way. No, it's a must. It's not an idea. It's not an option. It's not a certain way. You don't just believe there's a God. You have to believe past that certain point. Nicodemus only believed to a certain point, and we'll see Verse 1 says, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, Rabbi means teacher, 
We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, that means truly, truly, I say to thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. Say it with me, you what? Again? You really need to tell the person beside of you. Don't tell me. Tell the person beside of you, you what? The wind bloweth where it listeneth. Thou hearest the sound thereof. You can't tell where it cometh and whether it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say to thee, We speak that we do know and testify that we've seen and you receive not our witness. I've told you of earthly things and you believe not. How shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? No man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. So Jesus is saying, hey, I've been with God. I know what I'm talking about. I, I, I was in heaven. I, I came down to tell you this. And Moses, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Verse 18, he that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that is, the deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. I just want to walk you through the story so that we can get an understanding. Here's Nicodemus, a man that wouldn't want to be caught coming to see Jesus because he was part of the religious group. You see, they were rejecting Jesus. Jesus wasn't their prototypical Messiah. In John chapter 2, things changed. Here's what happened. You see, Jesus, he came to Jerusalem for the Passover feast. And Jesus saw something going on and Jesus made a scene in the temple. What do you mean made a scene in the temple? Well, you might remember this story. But listen, as Jesus was coming up to the temple, he saw these people that were buying and selling the animals in the temple that people were to make sacrifice for. And it angered him. He didn't sin in this anger, but it angered him. But let me explain to you a, a little bit behind the scenes, and I'll try not to go too far off. Understand, in the Old Testament law, the people who are of Jewish descent, the, the, the descendants of Abraham, were called to go and celebrate the feast of the Passover. All the way back from Moses' time. When the Passover feast was decreed, right? Remember, the lamb, the blood was put on the doorpost and the lamb will pass over. We learned about this a little bit more at Easter. But here's how they were supposed to come. They were supposed to make the trek to Jerusalem. And in that trek to Jerusalem, when they came into this on behalf of their family, they were supposed to present a sacrifice, the most perfect sacrifice that they could, a blood sacrifice, whether it was doves, whether it was sheep, whether it was goats. And it needed to be a blood sacrifice because this is what God called, knowing that he was going to give them the, most, the greatest blood sacrifice. So listen, here's what happened. The same thing that happens to us. It became hard to go all the way to Jerusalem dragging your goat, right? It became hard to keep those birds in the box without them messing things up. And so somebody said, we're going to make it easier. We're going to set up right outside of town Mike's sacrificial animal service right? Right on the main course. And so you can stop outside of town and you can pick up your sacrifice. Listen, if you keep a dove in a box too long and try to open it up to feed it, you'll mess his wing up, right? If you drag that goat too much, you'll skin it up. Listen, not everybody wanted to make the trek. They were coming from miles and miles away, so it just seemed easier. And somebody said, I have a better plan. Listen, I'm going to catch them and you don't have to bring it at all. I'm going to set it up inside of the temple court. You see, that was a sacred place. Sacred place. 
That whole temple was designed by God. So when Jesus walked in, he saw the money changers. And there were people negotiating, right? They were saying, I'll give you $5 for those two doves, but that's about all I'm going to give you. And the other person was saying, and they say, no, I'm not going to do it. It wasn't about the sacrifice anymore. It was about just what had to be done that was required. God had said, you must travel here with your sacrifice. But the law had been bent. They were still getting by. We'll pick it up on the way in. Kids, get in here. Let's go. Let's go. We're coming in here. We're going to present this. And so the whole time they could just act like they were serving God. Get there. Go through the motions. But it wasn't right. Jesus turned the tables over, threw the money. He said, you've made this place like a den of thieves. Listen, by the time Jesus made this scene, everybody knew who Jesus was. And then if you read, Jesus began to talk to this person and this person. He began to talk in crowds and people were like, wow. How does this guy speak with such authority? It's like he's been with God. So Jesus said, hey, as a matter of fact, I have. I came from him. With what authority do you tell us these kind of things? With what authority? I come as the son of God. I come as the son of man. This angered people. It was blasphemous. They said, this Messiah that we're looking for, this Savior that we've read about, he doesn't come from Galilee. He comes from Bethlehem. They didn't research deep enough. This man, Nicodemus, he knew all these things too. But Nicodemus, he was curious. Nicodemus wanted to get closer. Nicodemus came and experienced Jesus. He came by night, grant you. He didn't want anybody to see him. He didn't want to mess up or lose his role as part of the Sanhedrin. So he came at night and he said, Jesus, I know. I know that thou art a teacher come from God because nobody nobody can speak like you can and nobody can do the things that you do so I know you came from God listen at this point Nicodemus has said I believe you came from God and if you get down to these next verses you'll see something interesting Je says Jesus answered Nicodemus will you read this with me John 3 Verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I think this is interesting that the Bible tells us that Jesus answered him. Why do you say that? Because Nicodemus never asked him a question. Jesus' answer was in response to what he knew Nicodemus was telling him. Nicodemus was saying, I know you come from God. And do you know what this whole story is about? Can I stop here and tell you, this, this was revelational to me. And I can tell you, I was on my knees praying several weeks ago, and, and this, was, this was late at night. The, this word came, the word must came. And I began to think of this scripture and I thought there's something in there I'm not seeing. There's something in there. So as I began to pour through the scripture, all this time I thought it was about, hey, listen, this is about him telling Nicodemus, listen, here's what you need to be, uh, to be doing to be saved. And, and the same thing for God so loved the world. And listen, if you look a little bit deeper, you'll realize it's about something else. He was telling Nicodemus what we need to know today. All right. There is a must. And with that must, get this now because it's going to hit all kind of people, people that are believers, people that are not believers. We are, we are required, it is a must that we believe past the point that we're presently at. You say, well, hold on, I'm not getting that. I'll say it again. There's a must that you believe past the point that you're presently at. Let's go back and turn the page back a minute. Remember what we were talking about a minute ago? People that say, I believe in God. People that say, I'm religious. People that have went through this uh, certain class to get to God or that. The ruler, Nicodemus, was told by Jesus himself, there's a must, Nicodemus, that you're not following. There's a must here. You've learned all these things. You represent me, but Nicodemus, you must be born again. Except, that means unless you're born again, you can't even be a part of the kingdom of God. You're trying to represent the, the kingdom of God down here, Nicodemus, as one of 71. Unless you're born again, you can't even recognize or be a part of the kingdom of God. 
And then he goes on to say, hey, listen, Nicodemus, this born again is serious business. And this smart man, Nicodemus, said, hey, Lord, what am I supposed to do? I don't, I don't understand. Born again, Lord, born again. Do I need to enter my mother's womb again? Of course not. That's ridiculous. And Jesus said, Nicodemus, no, you're missing it. I'm not talking about being born of flesh again. I mean, I'm talking about being born of spirit. Be born of the flesh is flesh. Be born of the spirit is spirit. You can't be born again in the flesh. Listen, you have to be born again in the spirit. You know, you hear a lot of Christians throw that word born again around. And here's the sad thing. It often comes with a definition that's inaccurate. Hey, you need to love God and be born again. You need to think about and, and know that we can sing these songs and, and be a part of this church and be born again. I want to break it to you. Being a part of this church doesn't mean you're born again. Singing a song doesn't mean you're born again. Belonging to a certain denomination doesn't mean you're born again. There has to be something that happens within you, a rebirth. And he goes on to explain this, and it's an interesting thing, and I want you to be able to grasp this because, you see, Nicodemus was going to have to believe past the point of belief that he was presently at. Let's identify the point he was presently at. Jesus, I believe that you came from God. How many people hang their Christian faith today on just believing that Jesus came from God? I don't want to scare you. I'd like to intrigue you. The Bible has a passage of Scripture in Matthew 24 devoted to this that says, Hey, listen, in the last days, there will be a lot of people that stand in front of Jesus. And they will say, Jesus, Lord. And he will say, depart from me. I never knew you. And they will say, but Lord, we've done these things and we've done these things. And we sang in the choir and we joined the church and we hung up our stuff at Christmas and we celebrated Jesus and we believe that Jesus came from you. Yes, but you must be born again. A must. In verse 7, he goes on to say in John 3, Nicodemus, marvel not Quit thinking it's such a difficult thing. I'm saying this. You must be born again. Interesting here that we can look at Nicodemus and we can see his credentials and we can see that Jesus is adamantly telling him he must believe past the point that he currently believes. Jesus was going to instruct Nicodemus. He needed to believe and accept that he was the son of God, that he was the only way that Nicodemus could be saved from his sins is to believe past that point that he presently believed at that time. Nicodemus did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. He was the Savior. He was his only means to get to God. He did not believe that. He believed that Jesus was of God. So many people believe that Jesus is real today and that he did these miracles and that he was sent from God. So many people believe that God is real, just like Nicodemus. He was religious. He believed in God. He believed that Jesus taught about God. But at this time, Nicodemus had not accepted Jesus as the only way to have his sins forgiven. Nicodemus had not accepted that he needed to commit to trust Jesus to save his life. Nicodemus just believed that Jesus represented God. Now, so many people are in this condition today. And I used to be one of them. And there is no doubt, no doubt whatsoever, that today, within this congregation, there are people that are here today that have believed in God, have believed that Jesus existed, but you haven't believed past that point. We would be no different than Nicodemus that says, that's good that you believe it, but we must be born again. And then the next thing is, 
as we learn in Hebrews 11, there are people that are here today, and some may be listening by radio, some may be the podcast. It could be a CD somebody has put in somewhere. And God's get, got this message going out because you think you've believed to the point. And I'm not here to judge you. You'll know today because God will speak through this. You'll become so nervous, not by my voice, but by God's voice. It'll be a, a matter of a lack of confidence, even if you think. You see, I was a person that had went through the knowledge, but I stopped at a certain level of knowledge. It was a head knowledge, not a heart knowledge. I never took it into my heart. And what would have happened if the Lord would have come back or... If I would have passed away, well, I would have spent eternity in hell. I wouldn't have had fellowship with God. You want me to dress it up for you? No, that's what would happen. Why? Because it's a what? It's a must that you're born again. If you want to have fellowship with God. Without this, it's impossible to please God. And Christian. You think, yeah, preach that to those people that have it. We need to see souls get saved. Hold on a second. There's a lot of us that have believed to the point of salvation, but haven't believed any bit past that. You haven't believed in the diligency that he calls you to serve him more, to worship him more faithful, to pray to him more often, to read his word more, to study and, and want to be closer to him. No, we're not diligently seeking him. We stopped our belief at salvation and, and the consistency that's good enough for us, which says one time a week, God, we're going to come in and we're going to hear you and we're going to leave here. No, God wants something past that point. If not, it is impossible to please him. You say, well, I guess I'm not pleasing him. Well, it's got bigger connotations than, hey, I guess I'm not pleasing him. You see, to please Father God that's in control of everything means that his favor and blessing is on your life. To please Father God means you have an everyday relationship with him. To please Father God means that, hey, listen, your voice is heard by him and he wants to answer the desires of your heart. He wants to help you through times. If you're not pleasing him, listen, you're living a miserable, wrecked life. And you can't please him unless you're diligently seeking him. You see, you must diligently seek him. It's not the pastor that's trying to, to, to rally you to be more faithful or to serve more or to read more. No, it's a must. Not my words, his words. Jesus basically told Nicodemus, you have to believe past the point of knowing that I came from God to represent God. You have to believe that I gave my life for you as a sacrifice for your sins. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, as we read in here, listen, hold on, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Do you see that? As Moses lifted up the serpent, he's trying to tell Nicodemus, Nicodemus, it was a must that I come. The same way that Moses lifted up that serpent in the wilderness that everybody who had been bitten, who was, who was diseased and who was doomed to die could look upon that, I had to be lifted up on the cross. That's what has to happen. It's a must. I came to save people, but not because they believe that I came, because they accept by faith that I can save them. It's a must. Nicodemus, well, he got hung up on the whole birth process. Intelligent as he is, how can I enter the second time into my mother's womb? Listen, Jesus shut that down pretty quickly. He said, Nicodemus, we're not talking about physical birth. And I know sometimes you will hear somebody will say, yes. Now, Jesus said, hey, unless a man is born of, of water and born of the Spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, this was a big deal for Nicodemus, a Pharisee, uh, somebody of the Sanhedrin who thought, hey, listen, just because I was born in the right family, I have an inheritance, I'm going to be there. And Jesus was saying, it's not by physical birth that you make it to God. It's by water and spirit. And some people will say, well, yes, well, we've experienced birth before. We know that water comes before the baby and, and then the baby comes. And then, you, no, it's not talking about that. Any time that you see water and spirit reference in the whole Old Testament, listen, you, you can understand it has to do with cleansing. Cleansing. 
Jesus was saying, you can't be born again unless first you're cleansed from your sin and the Holy Spirit enters into you. You have to be born of the water and born of the Spirit. It can't happen unless these two things happen. Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. Where you're at right now, Nicodemus, this isn't enough. This isn't enough. You will not see the kingdom of God. You will not be a part of the kingdom of God. I can guarantee you that Nicodemus was shaking in his shoes right now. He was talking to the son of God that had the authority of God who was saying, you must do something more. You must do something more. It can't just be on your knowledge. This very smart man didn't understand this. And so as Jesus began to explain to him even more, he explained to him the birth that happened with forgiveness, the cleansing, the washing of, of our sins away by the blood of Jesus, the washing. But I wouldn't want you to take my word for it. Understand that when spirit and water are used together, it's always talking about cleansing Go back sometime and read Psalms 51. Read verse 2 that says, Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. Verse 7, Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Go down and read verses 9 and 10. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew within me a right spirit. When Jesus refers to water being a part of being born again, he was making a reference to the spiritual washing or the purification of the soul. Now, listen, there is not a one of you that can come to me and say, Pastor, we recognize you as pastor, and I want you to clear my sins away. I can't do it. I don't have the authority to do it. Listen, I'm a sinner myself that's been saved by the grace of God. There is only one thing that can wash your sins away and clean them, and that is for you to believe on the blood of Jesus. His his life for your life not that just he existed but you have to believe past that point you must believe that Jesus gave his life he became sin who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him see you have to believe past the point of just saying I believe in Jesus now I want you to listen to this key verse verse 7 you must be born again it's not an option it's a must he was telling Nicodemus he's telling us if you want to be part of the kingdom of God you must tell the person inside of you you must can I give you the definition our common definition for the word you must or must a requirement something that should be done without fail this is what we need to realize. There are not different ways to do something that we must do a certain way. We can come to God and we can accept his salvation, but there is only one way that we can do it. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, I am the way. That is a singular term, the only way. The truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's the only true way. You say, is that important? That's absolutely important. Do you realize in churches all across America today, in little podcasts going out and different stuff that people are being told, listen, listen, you can be good enough to go to heaven. People are being told, hey, listen, go through this and join our body of believers and we're going to come in and we're going to sing this and praise and Listen, we're just going to rejoice in the love of God. We are not required to do anything. And listen, you can be a part of the kingdom. And there's other churches that are the opposite that are coming in and they're being able to say, hey, listen, you come in and you do this and do this and do this and there's a bunch of different do's that we have to do and you can't do this and if you are obedient enough then you can join the kingdom of God listen Jesus is telling us he's the only way you don't come because you're a Catholic you don't come because you're a Baptist you don't come because you're a humanitarian you come to God through Jesus Christ it's a must that you do that but in your own knowledge in your own good works you can't do it for by grace are we saved through faith, that not of ourselves. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, what does it say? It's the gift of God, not of works we can't boast. You can't come to God. You must come to God one and only way. 
And us Christians, we hear that and we should amen that. But do you know what happens to us? We realize when we come that way, hey, we've come that way and we're here. Do you realize the must didn't stop it, that you need to know that God is God? The must went on with that conjunction that said and, and it said in Hebrews eleven six 6, and in order to please God, you must diligently seek him. So now we talk a little bit about sanctification. You see, you must come to God and be born again to be saved. But if you want to please God, you must do something past what you have to do. He requires you to put some effort in, right? It's a matter of not what you want to do, not what, not what, what is convenient for you to do. It's a matter of what Jesus said you must do. I realized that this was a, a service that really touched a lot of key areas that I see going on. In my Christian life, as, as I look back, there were times when I got to a certain point and I thought, I'm doing as much or more than somebody else is doing. And I lost my drive. Especially if you surround yourself with people that aren't doing much. That's funny, guys. You've got to laugh at that. <laughs> Surround yourself with underachievers. You will feel like an overachiever. Will you have drive? No. No, you won't have drive. And then I realized that there were other times in my life where I just thought, I, I'm in a certain part of my life where this is all I can give right now, God. I mean... Think about it. I mean, you've got to understand. I've got a family. I've got responsibilities. I've got work. And I began to think as I'm reading this verse and I'm looking at this faith, this trusting in God to take care of things, this is not just applying to people who are lost that must be born again. It's applying to Christians who have accepted the Lord. Listen, we, we've given up on this word diligently and we've said to God, basically, God, you have to understand the situation I'm in. I'm going through something right now, whether it's my, my education, I'm in school and I have so much time to devote to this. Listen, none of that was described in the word diligently. Hey, I'm a father, I'm a mother, I'm a parent, and you know what's going on with that? No, God said, I will always make a way for you to seek me. We We've stopped at a certain point and God said it's a must that you go past that point a must if you want to please God you can't just use the condition you're in to say this is all I can do God because the Bible tells us first Corinthians 10 13 God is faithful who has not suffered you to be tempted above that you're able to bear but will with that temptation also make for you a way to escape escape and do what fall in his arms love him past the point that you're loving him right now Glory to God. He's got it all figured out if I could just come along. I'm better to be told I must do something than to give me an option. You are too. But we get so defiant to God that we don't want to hear must anymore. And you know, the devil knows what he's doing because the generations coming up, generation to generation, they don't want to be told must for anything. And they've got a big fan club of liberalism that's telling them, you don't have to do anything. This law might say this, but it doesn't apply to you. The Bible might say this, but it doesn't apply to you. There's no must in your life. And God says there is a must. If you get a, give away the must, you have to give away the Bible. When we say we don't have to do anything, you've defied God and you've stood in front of him and you've said, listen, I don't have to do anything. Right, it's your choice, but when God said you must do it, you must do it. There are people that say you can come to God in different ways. Jesus told Nicodemus clearly, you have to come. We're taught today, you can come to him by learning enough. You can come to him by being obedient enough. No, listen, you must be born again. In order to have fellowship with God, in order to talk to God, you must. Well, that sort of leaves out all these other ways that people say you can come to God. Well, I can come to God, Pastor, by going to my pastor, and he can speak on behalf of me, and he will be my father that speaks to the Father. Listen, hate to tell you, but we're told in the Bible there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. There are no fathers besides Father God. The Bible even says, call no man your father except the Heavenly Father. 
What is he telling us? He's saying there's only one way to come to God. That's why we pray in Jesus' name. If I prayed in Mike Shove's name on how good he was and, and came to God that way, it wouldn't be worth a hill of beans. Why? Because Mike Shove is nothing. I'm only something through Jesus Christ. If I come to him in the name of Jesus and I say, Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name, he looks down and says, hey, there's that guy. He's covered by the blood. Listen, I'm ready to listen to you, right? I come in his name. I must. It's a must. And this is the beautiful thing. It's always been a must. I look back through the Bible and I thought, hey, well, how did this sneak up on us? Jesus talked about it from the time he started this ministry. Listen, I found this for you. I think it's pretty neat. In Matthew chapter 16, I'll read it to you. We won't go there. Write it down. Go back to your notes. It's pretty neat. Jesus was saying to his disciples, and Matthew records this. He had taught some things, and then he was on his way to Jerusalem. Listen to what Jesus said. Matthew says, from that time forth, verse 21, Matthew 16, 21. From that time forth, Jesus, from that time forth, Jesus began to show unto his disciples how he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and raised again the third day. Now, did you hear that? From that time he told his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem. He must suffer so many things. He must be mocked. He must be paraded. He must be killed. He must be raised again the third day. Was it a must? You know what? It was a must in order for him to save Sister Karen. It was a must. It was a must for him to save David. It was a must for him to save Ernest. It was a must for him to save Stephanie. It was a must. He had to do these things. With Jesus, he was saying, it wasn't an option. God didn't say, hey, here's, here's maybe something you want to do while you're down there, Jesus. No, he went to do this. It was a must for him. And so he relayed that must to the disciples. This is what I must do. Now listen as we get to Matthew 26, verse 53 and 54. As Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, listen to this story. He was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. And Peter, oh, bold Peter, pulled his sword out, right? And Peter was ready to cut off the ear of that soldier. Hey, I can't believe you're going to take Jesus. I got you, Jesus. And Jesus turned to Peter. He said, Peter, if I wanted to, I have the capacity, the ability right now to call 12 legions of angels to rescue me. That's 72,000, because we don't speak in legion, let me explain it. 72,000 angels to rescue me. Peter, I don't need your one sword. L listen to what he told him. He said, thinkest thou that I cannot pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled? That thus, hold on, it must be you know what he's saying there's going to be a day that old sinner shof he's going to need to come into fellowship with god i must do this peter i need to get whipped they need to spit in my face they need to mock me they need to hang me on a tree why it must happen if mike's going to get to god it must happen if Donald's going to get to God. It must happen if Ben, if Carrie, if Angela, if they're going to get to God. It must happen. It was a must for Jesus to die for me and you. That's a big deal. And because, because he died for us, you know what's beautiful? Because he died for us, because Jesus did what he must do, we see this explanation to Nicodemus and to us. There is something we must do. You see, God, God sent Jesus, but he can't be the only one that's doing what he must do. In order to come in a relationship with God, it's all about everybody doing what they must do. Jesus did his part. He gave Nicodemus our order. You must be born again. Later on, the writer of Hebrews said, if you want to please God, you must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those that diligently seek him. There are must for us to do. 
today, if, if you're here, understand you must ask him to be your savior. You can't be satisfied with saying, I believe there's a God. You can't be satisfied with saying, I, I went to church and they taught me about Jesus and I passed the class. Listen, I did that too, but still I was lost. Not by my words, Jesus said I must be born again. What does that mean? That means there has to be a time in my life when I realize I am not where God is. God is holy and I'm not holy. And he tells me I have to realize that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm one of those, that I do sin, and that I'm separated from God by my sin. But I have to realize that God made a way. He loved me when I was unlovable. Romans 5, 8 says he commended that love toward me that while I was a sinner, Christ died for me. He said, I must die for Mike, even though he's a sinner. I must die for you. And the Bible tells us that we have a choice. We must do this to be saved, but you have a choice. He said in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin, if you stay in your condition being a sinner, the wages of sin is death. And it doesn't mean you're going to die one day of cancer. It doesn't mean you're going to die of an accident. It means eternal death, separation from God. The wages of sin is death. But, praise God, the most beautiful but in the Bible but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. How do you do that? Listen, I plead with you. He says it's this simple, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. He said it's not just a mouth thing, it's a heart thing. It's not a matter of praying this prayer and say, God, I heard what the preacher said. Can you save me? I want to be born again. No, it's, it's a matter of God looking at your heart and being able to say, listen, he's realizing. He's realizing he's separated from me. He's confessing. What am I confessing? First of all, listen, this simple prayer, God, I'm a sinner. You say, well, I pray to God all the time. Listen, I know this is hard to receive. I get a lot of flack with this, but understand a lot smarter people from, than me ha will tell you this. God the first prayer that God can hear from you is, God, forgive me, I'm a sinner. That's making a relationship with God. You say, I pray all the time. Right. Until you pray and make a relationship with God, you're not in fellowship, can't pray in Jesus' name until Jesus owns your name. Until he writes your name in the Lamb's book of life, then you can pray in Jesus' name. You're confessing, God, I'm a sinner. Then you're saying, God, I'm confessing, get this, that I believe who you are. That he is, right? And I'm confessing that if you'll come to my heart and save me, I will diligently seek you. Hey, that covers that whole scripture of must, doesn't it? If you're here today and you've never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, your heart should be thumping right now about twice as fast because you're realizing I might not be connected to God. And nothing in, that I've said has scared you. It's the word of God convicting you. And that thumping, that's not your heart. That's what the Bible says in Revelation 3.20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's the hand of God knocking to say, don't you leave here today until you do what you must do. You say, I don't know how to be saved. You don't have to know how to be saved. All you have to know is that, hey, I'm a sinner. I'm separated from God. Jesus died for me. He's my only way. He lived a sinless life for me and died a sacrificial death. My only way to get to God is through Jesus, and I want him. I don't even understand it, but I want him. You must do it. You say, I pray those people do it. Well, Christian, while you're praying, let's think about something else because this speaks to us to understand this. We must continually seek him diligently if we want to please him. Hey, listen, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that if you watch Christians, they reach a certain point that they're going to serve God, a certain point of convenience, a certain amount they're going to pray to him, a certain way they can factor him into the day, a certain amount they want to learn of him, a certain amount of times they want to come to church, a certain amount of time they want to be faithful to him. We reach a certain point that has nothing to do with diligence. It's the opposite of the definition of diligence, right? When you're diligently doing something, you know what that means? With all your effort. Do you know that he tells you if you want to be blessed of him and please him, you must diligently seek him? I'll tell you a good test. Moms and dads, go home and ask your children after they've heard the sermon today, hey, in our household, do we diligently seek God? Wives, ask your husband 
if you do. Husbands, ask your wives. Do we diligently seek God or have we got an excuse around every corner of why we can't do something? Have we planned God into our plan for our life? That's not diligently. That's not putting God as a must. That's putting God as something you're picking up and putting down. I've done it before, I know. We must diligently seek him. That's to the Christian. Guys, he's speaking through his word today. We have an invitation time right now. This is a time that's a sacred time. Don't be talking. Don't be doing anything. Listen to God. Don't distract somebody beside of you. I want you to be able to see, are you doing what you must do? If you're in here and you're not sure you've accepted the Lord as your Savior, have you done what you must do? If you're in here and you know that you have, but you know, how am I living my Christian life? Am I doing what I must do to please God? I want everybody to self-reflect right now. Would you please close your eyes and bow your head? I rarely do this but I feel a need to. If you're in this room, please do not look around. I want you to be able to just be able to speak to God, just between you and God. Maybe you're in this room and you're saying to yourself, listen, I know that I've known God. I believed in God since I was little. My family was a good Christian family and, and I believed in Jesus and I know Jesus died on the cross, right? You've believed that. You've believed that he is, but have you believed past that point? Have you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior the way he told you you must be born again? Have you done that? If you're not completely sure, but you're nervous right now about it, I'm not gonna point you out. I'm not gonna call your name, but I do wanna pray for you. Would you please just lift your hand up quickly and you can put it back down. I wanna pray for you. Please lift your hand and put it back down. If, you, if you're, you're just not sure, amen, amen, amen. Anybody else? I just want to pray for you. Now, Christian, if you're in this room with no one looking around, if you're in this room and you know you need to do more to do God's must, if you can do more for him and he's showing you that right now and you're ready to just just ask him to give you strength to do more. I want to pray for you. I don't want to point you out. Lift your hand up right now. You know you're saved all over the room. God, thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. Father God, I love you. You see, Lord, how you've spoken today. I pray, God, knowing you love us, knowing you give us your word. God, you call us. You compel us to come to you. God, move in the service today. Let your spirit be full. As your children bow before you, Lord, give them a boldness. If there's, Lord, that one that wants to come today, if there's anybody that's listening today and they realize, they realize they're not completely sure that they've done what they must do to accept Jesus as their Savior, God, give them a boldness to come today. Lord, I'll pray with them. They'll know for sure. Lord, give them a boldness. And Lord, for that Christian that, Lord, we've stopped at a certain point. Give us that boldness. Speak today, Lord. Listen to the prayers of your children, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Guys, during this invitation time, I'm going to be standing down here. Nothing else in your life's matter. Nicodemus snuck to Jesus to see him. You're here today. Nicodemus did not get saved at that time. Even later on, he did. But today... Understand that Jesus was not ashamed of you. He took public humiliation and was crucified publicly. If he spoke to you today and you feel like you must accept him as your Savior, please slip out of your seat. Come down and let's pray. Make sure that you can accept him as your Savior. I'll pray with you. You'll know beyond a shadow of a doubt. And Christian today, if you need to talk to God, come talk to God. Are you at the point of doing all that you must do? If not, ask him for that strength. Stand with me, please. We're going to, page, we're going to play page 634. Please turn there.
God is good all, all the time he is. I appreciate every opportunity that he gives us to be able to share his word. And I pray that he spoke to you today the same way that he was speaking to me even when, when this sermon was an idea and he was leading in this way. Um, there are things that God said is a must. And so you have to give in to his authority in order to be able to, to let that happen. And I pray that God spoke to you today. I pray that he keeps speaking through you. If you were with us today, if you're visiting with us, we've loved having you. If you're here today and you're here all the time, thank you for the spirit you're bringing into this room. Never think you're where that you need to be and you can't go any further. Go past the point that you're comfortable at, right? That's what God's telling you to do. You must do it. Diligently seek him. I love you. I'm excited about being able to meet together tonight. I'm excited about what God's going to do. And I'll leave you with this. If God spoke to you today in the service and you're still a mess inside, I want to tell you something. If you leave here, there will be a million things to distract you. If you think that there's something that, that you're incomplete, if you've never accepted the Lord as your Savior, if you know you haven't done what He requires you must do, I'll be here after service. I'll talk to you. I would love to talk to you. It doesn't have to be anybody but us. We'll meet in a room and I can explain to you the prayer that, that you would pray. And I'm available for you. I just feel like somebody is leaving but is not sure about it. And I'm, I'm not somebody that can see the future. I'm just saying it's a feeling. If it is, and I hope I'm wrong, but if it is, I'd love to talk to you. But let the sermon resonate in your mind, okay? I look forward to seeing you guys tonight. I'm excited about it. Jason Klutz, will you dismiss us?